to this very warm Wednesday. Uh, today we're going to talk about government policy and the welfare state. Not really, but uh, that wouldn't surprise you. Uh, start off, uh, I have some more shorebirds for you. A couple species of plovers. This is a Wilson's plover, seen here without a neck, seen here with a neck. <laughs> it was there the whole time. So the other kind of plover we have is the piping plover. Something interesting about these birds, uh, they look kind of very uh, plain when uh, they are not breeding. They have kind of two different uh, looks. And so here they're just kind of looking for, for food, but when they're in breeding season, they get fancier and they have the kind of black eyebrow and black ring uh, around their neck. Here's one going for some sort of snack in the water. All right, those are our Wednesday birds. Any questions on the lab or any of the allocator stuff that we've been looking at? Uh, I know some folks may have questions about uh, the quiz from this week. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, that on Friday. Um, all right, so the agenda for today is to uh, take a deeper look at how memory is organized uh, and to particularly uh, look at uh, a problem that has kind of arisen over time as it relates to the speed of accessing memory versus the speed at which our CPU can execute instructions. And so here, uh, this shows some history in terms of the performance of a CPU or a processor. Uh, to be kind of how many instructions, how many operations it can do every second. Uh, and for a long period of time, up until the mid-2000s, and we'll talk about how it flattens out here in a, in a future lecture, but for a long period of time, the performance observed what was called Moore's Law. Uh, and this, in practice, was processors got about twice as fast every year and a half. This was great. Computers were getting faster. Uh, but unfortunately, the speed of reading and writing data from memory and a particular kind of memory called DRAM, and more about that later, but the speed of reading and writing from memory was not increasing at the same rate that the CPU was. So this meant that if the CPU needed to read or write from memory as part of doing an instruction, it was going to have to potentially sit around and waste a bunch of time. There'd be a long amount of time where the CPU could have been executing many instructions, but it was just stuck waiting for this communication with memory. And so we end up with this sort of memory bottleneck, where our CPU can access registers very fast, but we can't store everything in registers, and we have kind of main memory that we want to access, but this channel between the CPU and memory became a real bottleneck, where for this particular Intel processor, which is uh, now a bit, a bit old, but the Core 2 Duo could process kind of at least 256 bytes per cycle. A cycle is the amount of time it takes to execute kind of one instruction is how you can think about a cycle. And so when we're thinking about CPUs, we often think in terms of cycles, kind of just measuring kind of how many uh, 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 rate of instructions. Uh, but transferring data between the CPU and memory took place at only two bytes per cycle. Furthermore, it would take between 100 to 200 cycles for this sort of round trip. So uh, uh, to, for the CPU to get some value from memory that it needs to do, even though what it needs to do with that value is probably one cycle, 
it might have to wait 100 to 200 cycles before that value actually gets to the CPU. Um, so this is a big problem. And uh, our solution is going to be something called caches. What we're going to do is, is we're going to say, well, what if we could put some smaller, kind of much smaller but much faster piece of memory kind of in between the CPU and main memory, where if the data that we need happens to be in this cache memory, we're not going to have to wait nearly so long in order to read or write. And today's class is going to be about this hierarchy of memory. Of how do we use and arrange caches in order to solve this memory bottleneck? Questions so far? Kevin? Um, so is caches different from RAM now? Yeah, RAM, 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 yeah, RAM, RAM access memory. Is it, is it like a completely different place or is it like? Uh, so I, is an acronym, stands for random access memory. And this term means that we have many different bytes in memory, and we can just access sort of any random one with equal efficiency. Right? Any particular byte in memory is not faster to access than any other. Uh, this is in contrast to, say, if you store data on a magnetic tape, which uh, in rare circumstances, people still do, but this was the main data storage in early days of computing. You don't have random access memory because because you can't. It's not physically possible to just instantly jump to kind of any point on this big roll of magnetic tape. You actually need to physically sort of move the tape to the point where you want to read data. And so, in that circumstance, it becomes very important to kind of read a contiguous kind of chunk of data from this tape because you've kind of put the tape at a particular point. Well, with our random access memory, we can just jump to any byte. And there are kind of two main kinds of random access memory that show up in our systems. DRAM and SRAM. And the textbook has uh, some more details on these. Uh, but this D is dynamic, and the S here static. And our dynamic RAM, important things to know about it, going to use a single transistor, kind of a single tiny circuit for each bit of memory that we want. Uh, this means that we can kind of make it very dense, and it's pretty cheap to make, so we can have a lot of it in our computer system. Uh, however, It's sensitive to disturbance, which means electrical fluctuations in the system can actually affect what is stored in this memory. And The dynamic part of it is that the data that we have stored in DRAM actually sort of drains, like the information just kind of uh, uh, 
the, the memory kind of loses its information over a period of 10 to 100 milliseconds. And so the system actually needs to, at a fairly frequent interval, kind of refresh the values in DRAM to prevent them from uh, uh, draining away. Uh, and so we can have a lot of this, but it has some, some limitations. And our SRAM Kind of six times the transistors per bit of memory, and it's resilient to these disturbances and it doesn't drain over time. It's the static. And so, to get to Kevin's question of like, are caches RAM? Uh, yes, they are random access memory, but caches will often be SRAM which means kind of they're more expensive on a per bit basis, but uh, they're faster and don't require this, this refreshing. Angela. Can you explain the drains thing again? Like what's happening to the data? Uh, so each bit is represented by a voltage across some circuit. And this, uh, uh, like the, the circuit does not hold this state indefinitely. It will basically kind of decay until it's kind of, it doesn't, it's not storing our information anymore. Fine. Um, so with the one transistor versus the six transistors, is it the six transistors that make it more resilient? Yes, the, these circuits are set up so that they kind of maintain their value uh, in a way that you can't do with just single transistor. Chris? Uh, I am, I would say I'm not prepared to describe in detail what a transistor is, uh, but the way I think of it is it is, it's basically the kind of smallest unit of circuitry that we have in a computer system. Um, and so it tends, uh, there's basically kind of some, usually like silicon bit with some conductive material uh, on top of it. and like when we talk about a CPU, we're typically talking about kind of mi or like millions or billions of these transistors kind of arranged into uh, the, all the complicated circuits that make up uh, the computer hardware. Kevin? So I just wanted to know if you can So RAM is literally just a, an implementation of memory, right? So, for example, like uh, back then, you still can take the um, but now you use what they call RAM. Yeah, so, so RAM is just a particular category of memory. It just says you have memory and you can kind of access any point in that memory kind of equally. You can just randomly jump to any point. All right. So I want to kind of first lay out our kind of the, the programmer's view of memory, or kind of what uh, the program we write will see memory as. And we're going to draw memory as this sort of pyramid because. Up at the top, we have registers. We have a very small, very fast memory. And down at the bottom here, store data on a local disk of some kind, like a hard drive. And uh, we might also have data that we can access over the internet, um, which would 
be potentially much bigger, but also slower than a hard drive actually in the computer we're using. And I've labeled these two persistent storage. Uh, anyone know what makes disks persistent in a way that memory is not? Fine. Well, is it memory controlled by current flow and disks don't like you don't have to have it turned on to be, to, to have data on it. Exactly. Our memory is only going to store data when it has electricity. And so when it doesn't have electricity, it just it can't store any information. And persistent storage doesn't require electricity to maintain information. It's it can, it's just sitting there, um, and nothing's going to, to happen to it if it doesn't have electricity. And so this kind of programmer's view, I've said we're going to have these caches and main memory, but as far as kind of programs are concerned, we just have memory. Like you access a memory address, some data comes back, and when we start separating memory into kind of different levels. This isn't going to change how our programs interact with memory. They're still just going to use a memory address. And this hierarchy of caches is going to be transparent or invisible to the program. It's not like you need some different assembly instruction to read data from a cache versus read data uh, from main memory. This all happens kind of at the level of the hardware and is not something the program is directly controlling. So how do programs actually benefit from this idea of caching? And that comes from an idea called locality. Um, and the basic idea is program accesses data, it's likely that that program will access that same data again, or will access data nearby the data that it accessed. So one way we're going to look at this is if we have an array in memory, it's some contiguous chunk of bytes divided up into the elements of that array. And if we have a loop going through that array, we access the first element, and then we're going to access the second element, and then the third element. And so this loop is accessing kind of things in memory that are all next to each other. And so if our system can, once we access that first spot in the array, say, take the array and put it in a cache, then all the subsequent accesses to the elements of that array will be able to benefit from uh, the much faster kind of time to, to access the cache. And so we'll uh, think of two kinds of locality. Temporal and spatial. Temporal is thinking about as we look across kind of uh, the time that a program is running, kind of the same data if used at one point, likely to use kind of again nearby in time. And 
and our spatial locality is kind of thinking spatially in memory, like that array example, if we kind of access one memory location, likely that we'll access nearby memory locations in the future. This makes sense? Questions on this? This idea of locality and caching appears kind of all over the place in computer science. We're talking about kind of uh, at the level of hardware and, and memory today, uh, but the operating system does all sorts of caching. When you use a web browser and you go to a web page, uh, the web browser may cache uh, images or other information from that web page, so the next time you go there, it can load faster. Um, and then general caching is, and uh, this idea of locality of accessing the same data repeatedly uh, is very uh, a very powerful idea. So, uh, before I give an, an example of kind of good locality versus bad locality, uh, I just want to mention. Uh, The idea of multi-dimensional arrays, because when we're thinking about uh, locality and designing our programs to take it, taking it, take advantage of caches, uh, multi-dimensional arrays are often uh, a helpful example. And so, how many integers are in this array? All right. Yeah, why 100? Because it's dimensions, so we can't Yeah, this is saying we basically kind of have 10 sets of an array of 10 integers in this two dimensional array. Uh, and these multi dimensional arrays will be stored in what is called row major order which says, okay, we're going to have a chunk of 100 contiguous integers. And if we look at that chunk of memory, we have now index 0, 0 is the first integer. Uh, and if we think of this first one as the row and the second index as the column, Row major order says the elements of the rows will be what are next to each other in memory. So right after the first element of row 0 comes the second element of row 0. And then the third element of row 0, and so on. And eventually you get the first element of the second row in kind of this chunk of, of 100 integers. Does that make sense how these multidimensional arrays get laid out in memory? All right, so let's consider the locality of code that interacts with two-dimensional arrays. So I have the screen not down. So I have a function to sum up the elements of a two-dimensional array. And uh, I can kind of initialize ij and sum to 0, and then write a loop over uh, one index of the two dimensions, and then an inner loop over the second uh, uh, dimension, and sum up all the elements uh, like so. Uh, does that make sense? Questions on that code? So if we consider the pattern in which this code accesses uh, memory, we can see that it accesses the kind of 
index 0, 0, so the first element of the first row. Uh, and then this inner loop is being used as kind of the index of the column. So we're kind of proceeding uh, index 0, 0, then 0, 1, then 0, 2. So we're kind of going across the row as we access it, and then across the second row. Uh, and so given how the array is laid out in memory, uh, we would call this a stride 1 access pattern. Stride being the number of elements kind of between each memory access. And so this, we're just kind of moving one just to the very next element in the array each time. Uh, and that gives us our stride one access pattern. And so I have kind of a diagram here. Each row is in a different color. You can see each row is kind of accessed uh, in order. Uh, and then we get to a slightly different version of this same code. Uh, what's different about this summing up of the 2D array? Liam? Uh, the first for loop starts with J, so we're looking through the zero element of each uh, array. Yeah, all I've done is I've switched the two loops so that now this inner loop changes this index each time. And so we're, as Liam said, jumping from the first element of the first row then to the first element of the second row and the third and so on. And each row is n elements across. And so this would be a stride n pattern, kind of jumping n elements in memory every time we access uh, this array. And shown visually, it looks like this. We first element of the first row, first element of the second row, first element of the third row, then back to the second element of the first row, so kind of going down each column. And if you remember from our very first class, I showed you code just like this which was going through a multidimensional array. And when I switched the order of the loops, it got something like six times slower. And that was just exactly what we're looking at here, going from a stride one to a stride n access pattern. And the reason that gets so much slower is that the whole system is designed to make programs with good locality faster. And so when you have a program with or locality that's jumping all over the place in memory, it just doesn't get to take advantage of all the things that caches can, can help with. Questions on this? All right, so I'd like to do a bit of practice with this idea of locality. So I have six different uh, uh, things a program might do. I'd like you to work with your neighbors uh, to figure out for each of these, are they an example of spatial locality of, of accesses to nearby data? Are they an example of temporal locality, ac repeated accesses to the same data, or are they neither? Are they not sort of related to locality? So uh, uh, take a few minutes to, to work with your neighbors and see what you think about each of these program behaviors. Yeah. All right, let's talk about each of these. Uh, number one are uh, the loop variable in a for loop, uh, temporal, spatial, or neither. Charlie? Temporal. Why temporal? It's the um, really the same spot in the area that's going to change. Really, find what the loop variable is. 
Uh, like if we're doing four i equals zero, i less than something i plus plus, i is the, the loop variable. Yeah, so we're accessing the same same data over and over, so be useful not to have to go all the way to main memory each time. Uh, how about number two? It, Spatial. Yeah, accessing the array elements. Why is that spatial? Uh, because elements of array are right next to each other in memory, so you're accessing nearby elements. Exactly. And if we bring a whole chunk of the array into a cache, now if we continue accessing them in order, we've made future future accesses faster. Uh, number three. Liam? Um, is it temporal? Uh, why would you say temporal? Um, well, is the program, program keeping track of how long it takes? Uh, so this is specifically the printing how long it takes. <coughs> Rebecca? Um, we thought it would be neither spatial nor temporal because it like doesn't have anything to do with like actually accessing the data, just printing it. Yeah, that's 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 how I would think about it. So like if we're printing out how long something took, you know, that's just not related to the pattern of data access in our in our program. How about number four, reusing a temporary array? You know? Uh temporal. How's that? Because I guess we're just using data we've used before, so it's already in memory. Yeah. Exactly. And if we've just used this array, likely could be in a cache, and so using it again is going to be efficient. Lysander? It's only temporal and spatial. Like, because if you're reusing an array, um, that, could that also be spatial? Yeah, I think that's a fair point. That uh, if we're using something that is sort of a multi part structure, uh, Reasonable to say is both temporal and, and spatial. Uh, number five are uh, combining multiple variables into an object or struct. Rebecca? Um, spatial, because then you're like putting the variables into like adjacent places in memory. Exactly. If we're going to be, these are related, so we're going to be accessing them kind of. At the at the same time, uh, useful to have them in some contiguous chunk of memory. Uh, Kevin, you have a question? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll ask it. Off this one. All right, and last, uh, passing function arguments as pointers. So this is say like you could pass the struct itself, but instead you pass a pointer to the struct. DJ? I mean, if you think of it as like passing something as an argument for a function that probably is special, because like you need to keep like reusing, I mean, I mean temporal, because like you need to like reuse that argument over and over again. But since it's a function, and maybe it might also be using the spatial, spatial, because like if the pointer say it is like a pointer of the of, a, of an array, then it's supposed to be like something that's like something to us from it. Yeah, so I think it's it's reasonable to say that if we were, say, passing something like re to a function repeatedly or to different functions, then we are thinking about kind of locality. Uh, but if we're just saying in isolation, whether we pass it as a pointer or the struct itself, um, it might affect whether memory is copied, but it doesn't relate directly to locality in terms of the pattern of, of access to data. Well, um, so defining locality as temporal or spatial, does that actually affect how the computer handles it, or is it just for our own sake of the classification? Uh, the difference between, yeah, the difference between spatial and temporal is to help us think about the behavior of programs. It's not like caches don't do different things in these circumstances. Yeah. Bye. So the reason that um, we had that huge jump at the beginning of the term between the uh, the stray worm one versus stray and was the fact that you can employ 
caches for stride one, but you can't for stride n? Um, yeah, so, uh, in a little bit I'm going to kind of talk about a little more mechanically how caches work, um, but the one sentence version is stride one, we find the data we're looking for in the cache a lot more often than stride n, where we're sort of jumping around and the cache will have what was nearby, but we're not accessing what was nearby. Um, mm -hmm. just to that. So without caches, they would take the same amount of time. That's right. That, uh, that the difference in behavior we saw was because caches can dramatically affect the performance of our programs, even though our programs are not explicitly specifying use a cache here, don't use a cache here. All right. Uh, other questions on uh, these examples? Kevin? Okay. So, is the difference between spatial and some like locality? Is it like conceptually like they're different, right? Like, does it mean like there's a word differently somehow? No, it's just for us to conceptually think about the different ways in which our program might take advantage of a cache. Um, yeah, it's not that they're stored differently. All right, so uh, before I kind of get into more details about how uh, a cache might actually work, uh, I want to get into details of the first mass labor organization uh, in U.S. history, this would be the Knights of Labor. It wasn't literally the first kind of labor union, but the first kind of, uh, national one. And uh, this was in the kind of mid uh, 1800s. Um, there had been a lot of industrialization, a lot of railroads in the U.S., uh, and a lot of these jobs were incredibly dangerous. And in fact, a lot more dangerous in the U.S. than they were in kind of a similarly industrialized uh, UK. Um, and uh, so workers in the US, particularly on, on railroads, uh, started trying to improve conditions, things like an eight hour workday, uh, uh, getting uh, companies to try and do anything to prevent workplace accidents or take care of people who were injured at work. Um, and this Knights of Labor, uh, one of the main leaders of which was uh, this guy, uh, Terence Powderly, uh, kind of rocketed and, and kind of was organizing kind of national railroad strikes with uh, hundreds of thousands of, of strikers, uh, things like the, the Great Railroad Strike of 1866. Here is a, a drawing of a, a freight train which is being run by these uh, gun-carrying U.S. Marshals as the striking workers kind of protest uh, uh, the federal government kind of stepping in and taking, uh, 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 undermining the strike. A lot of these struggles of the Knights of Labor were against uh, this guy, Jay Gould, a railroad uh, magnate and financial speculator who uh, was kind of uh, incredibly uh, powerful in, in this time. Um, and uh, one of the kind of turning points for the Knights of Labor uh, was uh, something called the, the Haymarket Affair or the Haymarket Riot. Uh, it was a, a rally organized in Chicago to support um, uh, better working conditions. And uh, it's, ne it's not clear who, but someone set up a bomb at this rally. Uh, and then police and uh, demonstrators clashed uh, in the chaos. Uh, and this did a lot to discredit the labor movement at the time. People saw it as like violent and anarchic, uh, and the, the Knights of Labor kind of fell apart uh, in the years uh, after this event uh, to be replaced. Um, and kind of in their place, uh, the kind of what would become the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, would emerge, uh, led by Samuel Gompers. And I'll end with this. A uh, political cartoon from 1883 uh, from the magazine Puck. Uh, you have uh, labor 
uh, carrying a, a hammer labeled strike, riding a uh, uh, not very healthy looking horse labeled poverty against this uh, mechanical monstrosity labeled monopoly. And you can see over here, there's an area labeled reserve for capitalists. Uh, this spear is labeled uh, subsidized press. This plume is labeled arrogance. And the shield is corruption of the legislature. Uh, so this uh, this author had a had a pretty strong perspective at uh, you know the set to between labor and monopoly. All right, that's our history. So what I would like to do now is fill in this mystery area. So moving from the view of the program to kind of how a system might actually be organized. Uh, we have main memory, which, as we talked about, uh, would use uh, a DRAM. And kind of uh, on many systems, you have multiple levels of caching. Uh, so in the diagram in the notes, I use three levels of caches because that's how uh, Intel's x86 chips are organized. But uh, for example, if you have uh, an M1 Apple uh, laptop, you that has two levels of caches. Um, so the exact number of levels is uh, different from system to system, uh, but they're called like the L3 cache, the L2 cache, the L1 cache to represent these different levels. And all of these would be using SRAM. And the fundamental fact of this hierarchy is as we go up, we get memory that's smaller, faster, and more expensive on a kind of per byte basis. So you might say, well, if these caches are so much faster, why, why wouldn't we just kind of make everything uh, like the cache as well? That would be extremely expensive. Uh, both in terms of the amount of power and just the amount of uh, physical hardware we need to have. Uh, as we go kind of down the hierarchy, we get slower, we get bigger, slower, and cheaper. So to put some some numbers to this, uh, accessing our registers can be done just as part of executing an instruction. So that's basically zero cycles to access a register. But how much how, how much total space do we have in, in the registers we've been talking about? <coughs> what? So I think like eight, each register has like eight bytes, and we have like 12 registers, or more than 12. Yeah, well, we've been talking about the 16 general purpose, so like something like 16 times 8 bytes. So extremely small amount of memory in these registers. Uh, if we were to combine all the caches together kind of across however many levels we happen to have, uh, we're talking something like 4 to 75 cycles to access data from a cache. So you know a lot slower than a register. But we have something like 10 megabytes, 10 approximately a million bytes. So many orders of magnitude more data than we can put in a register. Uh, and then when we move down to main memory, uh, we're looking at hundreds of cycles to access main memory. Uh, but when it, our systems are 
typically going to have gigabytes, kind of billions of bytes worth of main memory. So again, orders of magnitude more than we can fit in caches. Uh, and when we're talking about reading or writing data from our, our hard drive, our disk, uh, that is going to be 10 of millions of cycles to access the disk, uh, but that often comes in terabytes. Uh, well. uh, cycle is the time it takes to execute a single instruction. So it's kind of measuring time in terms of the speed of our CPU. So if our CPU needs to, uh, so in the time it would take to access main memory, our CPU could typically execute hundreds of instructions during that time. So if it has to just wait and do nothing for uh, to wait for main memory, we're kind of losing out on hundreds of instructions we could have been executed. Other questions? So to give you kind of a, a, a metaphor for kind of what, how you might think about this hierarchy, uh, if I want to kind of have some, some avocado toast, if it's a register, the toast is like already made, it's on my plate, just need to eat it. If I have to go to the cache, I like have to like go slice up the, I have the other cut, I have to go slice it up, kind of make, uh, make the toast. Uh, if it's, if I have to go to main memory, I don't have the avocado, I have to like get in my car, go to the store, buy the avocado, come back, make the sandwich. Uh, if I'm going to disk, I have to plant an orchard, grow the avocados, send them to a store, then get them from the store. So it's just an eternity to interact with the disk compared to other places of storage. So uh, when, uh, but of course the advantage is we have like orders and orders of magnitude more space, more stuff that we can put on the disk. Uh, so systems like databases um, where they want to store a ton of data but access it efficiently, you uh, have to think very carefully about how they interact with the disk and ways to say use caching or clever data structures to make accessing the disk sort of manageable from a performance perspective. Questions on this one? And then how long might it take to uh, access or write stuff to the remote disk? Um, yeah, so our, the, the remote disk, um, it could be comparable to the local disk if you have a, a very fast network. It could be orders of magnitude slower if you have a, a, a slow network, so it's sort of bound by your, your network connection. Uh, the main advantage is that you can have, again, orders of magnitude more, uh, more space because the number of hard drives you could conceivably get to via the internet is much larger than the number of hard drives you could have in your computer. Uh, but I would say kind of the, the remote disk is just a lot less predictable because it relies on kind of the unpredictable network. So I would say it kind of ranges from similar to like tens of millions uh, of cycles up to like an unbounded amount of time where you just can't actually access the, uh, uh, the remote storage. Other questions? Yeah. So I I don't get what um is the cat. So 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 cat is stored on like the physical hardware, right? It's stored on the main set. And then name every local disk, we wrote this, it was just like the hard drive, like SD hard drive, hard drive. Uh so everything from local disk on up is part of the actual like stuff in your laptop or, or the computer system. Uh, main memory is a kind of RAM, usually DRAM. The caches and registers also RAM, but the more uh, faster, stable, expensive kind, SRAM. Uh, and local disk uses different technologies. You mentioned SSD, standard solid state drive. Uh, that's what you'll find most often these days, uh, though you will 
you can find uh, computers with what are called spinning platter drives. There's some like uh, a set of uh, magnetic disks which are uh, holding the data, and there is uh, like a kind of a, a reading, and they, the disk actually spins so that a kind of head can read off the data that are on the disks. Um, fine. Are those mechanical drives? Yes. So hard disk drives or mechanical kind of uh, HDDs, hard disk drives, mechanical drives, refer to these usually these kind of spinning uh, platter disks. Um, uh, solid state drives don't have any moving parts and so are uh, faster for, for that reason. All right, let's talk about uh, how uh, a picture of how a cache might actually uh, function. So our basic idea is that our cache has room for some number of blocks of data. So A block of data is just some number of bytes and uh, the size the size of a block is going to vary uh, by cache. So uh, the L1 cache might have relatively small bytes, like 16 bytes, uh, relatively small blocks, say 16 bytes. Whereas larger caches like the L3 cache might have um, 512 bytes in each block. Uh, but the key idea is that the cache is arranged into some set of blocks of data. And uh, from the cache's perspective, memory is also arranged Into these blocks. Oh, um, so for the caches, is it what varies? Is it how many blocks or the size of the blocks? Uh, both. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, we won't get into the nitty gritty of kind of all the different parameters that govern the structure of a cache. If you're curious, the textbook has uh, kind of probably m more information than, than you uh, care to know about that. Um, but let's say that in this picture, uh, we have, we'll just label these blocks. Uh, and you can think of each of these blocks as maybe just like our range of uh, like zero is it kind of includes the bytes from some address to uh, sort of our like, If our block size was 16 bytes, then uh, this block zero would be the first 16 bytes of uh, memory, then the next block would be the next 16 bytes, and so on. Um, and the way this works is that when the system, uh, when the CPU kind of accesses a particular memory address, that's anywhere within a given block, that entire block gets copied into the cache. So if we uh, kind of access an address somewhere in block one, block one gets brought into, brought into the cache. Uh, block one is currently in the cache. And kind of the first place that the system checked, kind of CPU sent the request for some address. It checked in the cache. The address was not there. And so uh, we, uh, we checked cache. Uh, 
first step was we checked the cache for the address that we were looking for. If the address was present, we get what is called a cache hit, meaning we found what we were looking for and we stop here. We can just send the data back to the CPU. If it's not present, that is a cache miss. We did not find what we were looking for. Uh, when we get the cache hit, we sent, we just stopped there, sent the data back. If we get the cache miss, we basically repeat this at sort of the next level in our hierarchy. So CPU says access some address. We check the L1 cache. Uh, if it's not there, we get a cache miss. Then we check the L2 cache. If it's not there, we get a cache miss. Check, check the L3 cache. And when we get a cache hit, we copy it all the way back up the hierarchy. So what I mean is if we're looking for some address, we go all the way down to main, we have miss in L1, L2, and L3, we find it in main memory, we're then going to copy that block into L3, and then copy that block into L2, and then copy that block into L1. And you know, the one way to think about this Each level of this hierarchy is acting as a cache for things that are stored in the next level down. So everything that's in the L1 cache is also in the L2 cache. Everything in the L2 cache also in the L3, and so on. And if we continue with this, we access uh, an address in block 4, an address in block 8. We've copied those into our cache. Then we access an address that's in block six. We look in our cache, it's not there. So we go to the next layer, we find it in six. What do we, like, we don't have room for it in the cache. So what should, if we found it, we want Based on locality, we want, we're, we're thinking it might be accessed again soon, so we probably need to put it in the cache. How might we choose, like, what to do in that situation? What? Could you just overwrite the cache that hasn't, has been used least recently? Yes, this is a very common, uh, Replacement policy, our kind of way of deciding if our cache is full, what thing gets replaced with the new block we're bringing in. And least recently used, or LRU, very common replacement policy. Kind of makes intuitive sense if we're thinking in terms of locality. The data that was used the longest time ago seems like maybe we can make a, a safe guess that it's not going to be used again very soon. So in this example, uh, which was the first block that I brought into the cache? Yeah. Yeah, one was there first, and if four and eight have been used more recently, then we 
overwrite one with six. Six is now in the cache, and one just exists in main memory. Eight. Um, if the lower level caches are also full, does it rewrite one in every single cache level? Uh, do you mean like we need to? We missed all the way down. These are all full. Yes. It will. It will replace something at each level as it as it goes as it goes up, and I, this can be very helpful uh, because the L1 cache might not be big enough to hold all the data that our program is currently using. But maybe the L2 cache is big enough. And so we're sort of moving things in it. Uh, kind of, there's maybe lots of turnover in the L1 cache, but all the data we're using is sitting in L2, and so we still are getting to it much faster uh, than main memory. Uh, so this is one reason why it's useful to have kind of each have sort of copies of the data all the way up because if it gets kicked out of one level, it's still in the next level down if we access it again. Kevin. So does it only copy to the next user level or does it copy all the way up? Copies all the way up. Other questions? Cool. Wait, so how do we like is there like metadata keeping track of what was like Recently used or when it was called. Yes, yeah, so uh, this logic of kind of where to put blocks, how how to check if the address you're looking for is in the cache, uh, this is all actually implemented in the cache hardware itself. There's not some program that's running to do this, it's just like logic embedded in the hardware. Um, and uh, that same hardware is doing something to do to implement its replacement policy. So uh, this typically isn't like precisely least recently used because doing that exactly requires maybe kind of more overhead than we want. Um, so you might have something of just remove something that is not the most recently used or some other sort of approximation of least recently used. Rebecca? Um, so what would be like another replacement policy besides least recently used? Um, so one, one policy that uh, is very simple and fast and can be useful in some circumstances just replace a random block. Um, there are some cases where most recently used is actually a good policy. Um, if you are, um, like, if the data that you just used, you are done with that and you're never going to use it again, but you are going to use some other, you're going to keep coming back to some other data, then the most recently used might actually be the kind of optimal thing to, uh, uh, to replace. Um, one approximation of least recently used that's very common is uh, called uh, the uh, clock algorithm. Um, and I think it gets the name, thinking of the hands of a clock sort of sweeping around. And it just says, periodically, kind of go through all the blocks and mark them as, uh, uh, kind of mark them as this, uh, like, kind of tag them all, like the clock has, has uh, uh, touched them. And then the next time the clock, and any time they're accessed, you mark them. So the clock goes through, marks everything as this hasn't been accessed. And whenever it's accessed, you mark it as accessed. Uh, and then when the clock goes through again, if it sees something that is still marked as not accessed, it now kind of knows that's um, that has not been accessed for kind of two uh, uh, cycles of this. And so it can maybe safely be kicked out of the cache. Other questions? So I think I'll just close with a picture of a real 
or an actual cache structure. So this is a diagram here of an Intel processor called the Core i7. And this is a processor with four separate CPUs, uh, also called cores. So that's the Core 0, Core 1 and 2, and then Core 3. And each CPU has its own registers and its own L1 cache and its own L2 cache. And the L1 cache is actually separated into a D cache, a cache for data, and an I cache, a cache for instructions. Because instructions are also stored in memory, and we also have to like go to memory to access them. And so we also would store those in a cache. And they can also benefit from locality. For example, if we're repeating the instructions of a loop, we're accessing the same data, the same, the, the same instructions in memory over and over. And then there's, uh, in this case, an L3 cache that is shared across all these cores. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, lab four has been posted. Uh, the thing you should do today is to fill out the partner survey uh, because you can work on work with a partner on labs four and five. Uh, you can opt to you can also work alone, uh, but you can choose your partner or ask to be matched with a partner. I expect everyone to fill out that survey. Uh, I have office hours shortly, and I'll see you on Friday. Thank you. Thank you.